Hey there, Skeleton Key here, and welcome to week four of February. It's not off to a super great start. I did not finish Made for Love. I do plan to, but um, I have a feeling I'm going to have to return it to the library and request it again, and I'm sure it will take a while to make its way back. This one, I think, is this one. This copy, I think, is from the Denver library, so... So it'll have to go back to Denver, and then I'll have to request it again, and I'll have to come all the way back. <sighs> but um, it's it's really bizarre. It's about this woman who leaves her husband uh, and moves in with her dad, and her her husband is so he's like Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and. Whoever runs Google. Who runs Google? I don't know who runs Google. But anyway, it's like all of these guys rolled into one. Sounds to me like even more of a jerk than than I would imagine all of those guys being rolled into one being. But he's just really creepy. And um, so so she's left him. And, and the idea is that she's divesting herself of all of her tech so that he can't track her and and then there's this and then her dad um doesn't have room for her in his life I and mean, it sounds like he never had room for her in his life but he really doesn't have room for her in his life now that he has a a sex doll um so that's just bizarre uh, and I'm told that it gets even more bizarre. Uh, and then there's this guy named Liver, and there's this guy named Jasper, and there's a dolphin thing going on, and it's weird. Uh, did I mention this is for the Fucked Up Book Club? So, and it's, it's already fucked. I'm, I'm not super far into it and it's already extremely fucked up one of the things i'm really liking about it is that this story could go pretty much anywhere um I, this is not a predictable story at all every everything that happens i'm just like okay that was unexpected and then my name is a rum uh that one i'm gonna try to finish that one I only got one story into it, and I think there's like 14 or 15 stories, something like that. I counted, but then I forgot. Um, but I got one read, um, and I think that the description that said something about like Tom Sawyer. So I don't know if he's so much the Tom Sawyer character. Well, maybe. But it's about this, this kid, and he's in in Fresno and it's early 20th century and I think yesterday I said it was like the turn of the 20th century I think it's a little bit later so this book came out well this edition of this book came out in 1940 and so they said 30 years ago so so the action of this book I believe is supposed to be somewhere around 1910 or wait I read something else. I read, there's like an introduction. Oh, and he also says how to pronounce the name, but he doesn't really do it phonetically. So, but it's the, the, the kid's last name is, it's like two Turkish words put together. So I'm going to have to find somebody who knows Turkish, which actually there, there are a lot of Turkish people in this town. If I can ever get to the point that I can go back to the salon. Yeah, this, this color is from a year ago. I have not been to the salon all year. The fact that there's any color left means Marat knows what he's doing. But Marat is Turkish, so I will... Hopefully someday here I will be able to make an appointment to get my hair at least trimmed. I need, if not, because, I mean, that's, it's really frizzy on the ends. Um, 
and yeah I'll have days that I'll try to comb it and I'm just like mm, yeah no we're not combing the hair today <sighs> but I can ask Marat how to pronounce that name but there was something in the introduction about what years it covered and I gather it's semi-autobiographical and then you know I was looking up the author to William Sorian and he's like won an Oscar I think and a Pulitzer so I'm I, I'm not sure why I've never heard of him before I would like to get through that one before I send it back so I'll try and I haven't even looked at The Haunting of Bryn Wilder. So, I'll, you know, I will definitely read a chapter of that tonight. Definitely. But now I need to get moving on The Huntress. I've borrowed that on CD from the library. I think it's like 14 CDs or 15, something like that. So... I have, I have till Wednesday evening to get that. So, so yeah, and I will insert in here some footage from my afternoon activities, which were book crossing related. Um, the neighborhood book box was, I mean, it's not stealing, it's not illegal or anything, but it's it's kind of bad form. Somebody took all of the books out of the neighborhood book box over the weekend. Either, and and somebody somebody in the Facebook group said that they they put some they put a whole bunch of new books in there Saturday, and the book the box was already, you know, already had books in it. And they added more Saturday, and then Sunday morning, somebody drove by, and it was empty. I went over there today, it was still completely empty. And the guy who built it and does all the maintenance on it um, said he's not planning to do any maintenance until summer, so it's not like he took them all out to do something maintenance-related. So somebody trying to sell books, and... The thing is, I mean, I feel bad for people who are in a money crunch, but they're just going to find out that that, you know, going around to little free libraries and things and, and scooping out all the books and, you know, sort of indiscriminately, it, it, it's not an efficient way to make money reselling books. Because there, you know, a lot of the books in there are not like, you know, hardcover bestsellers from the last two years, um, and and I put book crossing labels on books. And, well, and right now a lot of bookstores aren't even doing trades or you know anything like that. They're not buying used books right now because of COVID. And but if they find a store that is buying books most bookstores won't buy books that have book crossing labels so they'll either just if they don't notice the book crossing labels in there and then the bookstore will notice them and say nope can't buy that one or if they do notice they'll they'll try to rip it out and damage the book so they're not going to get as much money because the book's damaged and I wouldn't begrudge somebody who, you know, if they needed money and they they actually knew what they were doing and they picked out, like, oh, it's like, oh, those are recent hardcover bestsellers. I'll take those and go buy them and go sell them to the bookstore. I'd actually be okay with that. But no, they took all of the books out of it. So now we've got to refill it completely, starting from scratch. So anyway, this next little bit, follow me on today's Book Crossing Adventure. So, over the weekend, somebody 
cleaned out the library. That's just kind of rude. But I've got some to put in. Okay, people, my books look very, very lonely. So it is Wednesday already. And yesterday, and yesterday I did get some reading done. Um, I turns out I have a few days left. I have almost a week left to finish reading this. It doesn't have to go back to the library just yet. I did catch up a little bit on Theft of Magna Carta. I didn't get a whole lot farther in that. Um, I mean, like, I guess I spent a lot of time going back and going, oh, well, who are these people again? Because it had been a month and a half, I think, since I started reading it last year. But I did make a little bit of progress. And one thing that's just kind of weird is, okay, so this is from the early 70s, and it's just really weird reading about adults doing grown-up things you know, criminal grown-up things, but grown-up things in a, in a social environment when I was a toddler at the time. You know, and I'm thinking back to the fashions as I perceived them as a toddler. And yeah, even when I was a kid, I had, I did not like, okay, so this, we're talking early 1970s here. And even in the 1970s, I could tell the 1970s were just crap on just so many levels. I hated the fashion. I hate. I hated so much about the 1970s. And even as a toddler, I hated. I hated so much. So I'm. I'm reading this and having these same reactions and everything. And bleh, bleh. God, I hated the 70s. I mean, we have this one picture of me. And you can tell just, and I remember, I'm like two in this picture, but I remember going to the photographer and I remember I hated that dress so much. It itched so much. It was like smocked and, and it was probably polyester double knit because cause my mom was apparently really into polyester double knit and it itched like crazy. And you can tell in the picture and I remember, I remember trying so hard to just rip that dress off my body. They had to fight to keep me in that dress. Oh, 70s were just awful. But yeah, so they describe what somebody's wearing in this book. And I'm just like, yeah, sounds awful. So I made my honey walnut shrimp again. And I tried using buttermilk this time. I think I may actually like, well, I'll see how it tastes, but I think I may actually like the yogurt soaking of the shrimp better um, than the buttermilk, uh, at least as far as getting the, the breading to stay put. And this time I did remember to garnish with scallions. I'm going to put on the Huntress and listen to that for a while while I eat my shrimp. It's snowing today. Glad I went out earlier. So I did make it to the library during curbside hours. I returned The Haunting of Bryn Wilder. I did read the prologue in chapter one. And then I went... And, and I wasn't hating it, but then I went over to, to the live show that, that Gabby and Olivia did because it was their um, winter ween that that was a group read for. And they both gave it like one or two stars. I think Olivia gave it one star and I think one of them gave it one star and one of them gave it two stars. They, they were not impressed. I, I don't see it in the branding anywhere for it, that it's part of a series, but it mentioned things and people from Daughters of the Lake, and it's clearly a sequel, or at least in the same world, 
And it was very clear to me that it was going to be a lot the same kind of thing. And I didn't hate Daughters of the Lake, but I just, I was, I did not feel compelled to finish uh, The Haunting of Brent Wilder. So I'm DNFing that one and I returned it to the library. So it's going back to Denver um, and I will not be requesting it back. But then I did pick up Berserker by Amy Laybourne. Um, I think this is YA. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's YA because um, this is for a book club and a few people in the book club have already said, yeah, I'm not here for YA right now. So they're not, they've already DNF'd it. Uh, I'll give it a try. I'll see what I think. I. I don't have any particular feelings for or against YA at this point, so we'll see if this changes that. Well, it is Friday night, and I, I have I've been kind of bouncing around between books, so it's been a while since I actually finished anything. But I'm I'm today I've mostly been reading. Um, brownies and broomsticks and this theft of Magna Carta um, this is getting really kind of it's kind of interesting for um, you know I, I talk about how much I hate the 70s but um, there's some really interesting stuff going on here well I got to looking up uh, John Creasy and I knew he was prolific, but he, like, wrote, like, 600 novels? And, I mean, there's prolific, and then there's, like, damn. Wow. Um, but, and he died in 1973. This book came out in 1973. And then he apparently left so many completed novels that they were still publishing his novels into maybe even the early 80s, but the late 70s at least. Uh, and he died in Salisbury, where this is set. That's sort of an interesting... I, I mean, I'm not trying to make anything out of that, but, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. I'm actually pretty impressed with the way he writes women. I mean, we're talking early 70s here, and he he's giving the women in, in this novel rather a lot of agency, and, and he's, I'm not sure if he's, I don't think he's described their breasts even once, so, you know, he'll comment on them being beautiful, but, but he's not really going overboard, he's not being needlessly descriptive. One of the women characters is a police officer and he does call her a woman PC, woman police constable, but from what I've read in, from what I've seen in other police procedurals of the era, uh, that was actually the official terminology. Um, that wasn't him as a writer making a comment on on a woman in a man's job kind of thing. But something really interesting that I've noticed is is the technology that Scotland Yard, at least in this novel, has in the early 70s. They have a fax machine, and um, this detective has a cell phone. Or, well, I mean, it's it's called a radio telephone. But yeah, he's like out on the street and he uses his radio telephone to call headquarters to make arrangements for something. So basically, yeah, cell phone. And and the fax machine. I So I was like, when was the fax machine invented? The first fax machine, and of course it's, it's radically different from what, you know, a 20th, a late 20th century fax machine. But 1843. The first patent on on a fax machine, 1843. Technology is a weird, weird thing. It is Sunday night, the last day of February. 
I did not get nearly as much reading done this week and this month as I wanted to. Uh, I'm gonna go, just go through this little stack here sort of randomly. Just and talk about what I did and possibly didn't read. All right, so here we go. Theft of Magna Carta by John Creasy. Um, too bad I didn't save him for March, um, which is genre land. Um, the theme for March is prolific author. Got to look at this guy up and he wrote 600 and some books under 28 pseudonyms. And he was only in his like early 60s when he died. Wow. Um, wow. And this was pretty good. I mean, this this came out in 73, 1973. And, you know, I talked a little bit about how the female characters seem to have a fair degree of agency. And um, by the end of the book, some of that had had changed a little bit. Still, for 1973, I thought the women characters were pretty decently presented. I mean, he would talk about their physical beauty, um, and there's one character, he kind of comments on her body, but he doesn't, he doesn't really, even with that one, he doesn't even really make any judgments as to... Oh my God, why do you marry her or anything like that? I, I noticed there was a lot more of, why is this hot chick with this ugly dude? There was a lot more that direction than, uh, and I don't think there was anything the other way around, really. There are murders. However, this is not really a murder mystery. This is, is it a murder mystery at all? I don't think it's a murder mystery at all. It's, there are murders, but <laughs> the, it's not really a mystery how they happen. Um, it's a heist novel. So if you're looking for a pretty decent heist novel, um, now this, it doesn't go into a lot of detail about the planning of the heist or, you know, building the team, you know, how a lot of, Oh gosh, I'm I can't, I'm blanking on movies, but um, a lot of movies in the oh, last 10, 20 years have been about heists and it's about assembling the team and and you know synchronize your watches and all that. And actually, I haven't watched very many of them. I've just seen the previews. Um, heist movies really aren't my thing. Depending on what you're looking for. And, and there's actually, I mean, this is only about like 203 pages, something like that. It's just a little over 200 pages. And there's a fair amount crammed in here. So, um, so you know, it, it's not, I mean, it was obviously something that he cranked out. Like, he apparently cranked out everything. You know, he, he wasn't aiming to write literature. So, uh... But if you're looking for a, a quick heist novel, you could do a lot worse. Oh, and by the way, the, the skull on the cover and the roses has, as far as I could tell, nothing to do with the plot or the characters or anything. It was the 70s. How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. I did get started on this today. I'm not going to get finished with it today. I, I'm still going to read it because I think it's, um, it, I, you know, I'm not very far into it. I'm, I've read the introduction and I've just started chapter one, but this promises to be really interesting and really useful. And it already touches on, on some things that are meaningful to me. So, and speaking of anti-racist issues and Ibram X. Kendi is the author on that. Ibram X. Kendi is also the author on this anti-racist baby. Um, and then you can also see it. This is a children's book. I, I don't know how much of an actual children's book this is. I mean, um, 
you do have you know the bright illustrations and you know a little bit of text on the pages so so it is that but i think this is actually more for the adults i think the pictures it, it it's sort of an interesting mix of the pictures and everything are good for the kids i guess i'm not i'm a non mommy i don't know what i'm talking about here but my guess is that the pictures are there for the kids and the text is to drive home the message to the adults is don't, you know, don't teach your children bad habits, basically. Um, and it's, I think it makes an interesting companion uh, slash introduction to this book as well. Even if you're not a parent, it's it does have in the back, it has Dear Parents and Caregivers, and it's got two pages of much, much more compact text, um, talking a lot about how to raise an anti-racist child and, uh, you know, very important issues. And I think does a good job of, of creating that distinction between not racist and anti-racist because they aren't the same thing. And, um, you know, looking back on my childhood, it's anti-racism really wasn't a thing. As much as I can credit my mom with really trying to instill good value in both of us kids, I, I, I think for rural Missouri in the 70s and 80s, I am probably a little bit ahead of the game, but there is so much I still am learning. So, um, yeah, I, I do want to finish How to Be an Anti-Racist. And, and I've read uh, Stamped from the Beginning by that author. And I really like his writing style. Um, it's very straightforward, very clear. I do like that. And then today I did finish Brownies and Broomsticks by Bailey Cates. Um, this was really nice. I, I, I really enjoyed this. So this is the only book I got through in that little mini challenge that I was doing for Literary Diversions. Hi, Leanne. I'm failing miserably. Uh... Yeah, I've got like 45 minutes. Oh, no, not even 45 minutes left in the day. And and I'm on mountain time, so I have failed miserably. Uh, I did... I'd have to look at the... I don't know what time I finished this today. So by your accounting, Leanne, I may not have even finished this one on time. But this was my... Um, cozy mystery with a cover I love and I was very tempted for one challenge there was a challenge to um, read a book with an aircraft on the cover and I was like can I count the broom but they do not do any flying on brooms in this novel so I decided against that but there's a cat there's even a dog um, because the main character is allergic to cats, so the cat does not have much uh, time on the page. But, you know, this is the perfect cozy cover, especially for, for a supernatural cozy. You've got magic, you've got a spell book, you've got baked goods, you've got a cat. It's, yeah, this is great. And of course, it's a mystery, so I have to be careful what I say not to give stuff away, but... Um, I will say there is a love triangle that doesn't get resolved by the end of this book. I don't know where the author is going with that. But um, but if, yeah, reader beware. If you hate love triangles, you might have a problem with this book. I liked that they had sort of a neophyte... Um, they had had sort of a neophyte witch for the POV. It, it is first-person POV. Um, 
which is pretty common with cozies. And you know, one thing I love about cozies is so often the nasty person who's introduced in chapter one gets killed right away. Um, yeah. And that, that, that to me is just very, very satisfying. There, there's quite a bit of diversity in the supporting cast. And I mean, this was the first novel in the series, so it didn't really go very deep into those characters, but there are at least nine of these now in this series. So I anticipate that the author will be including a lot more on those characters as well as the series progresses. And I'm looking forward to that. And because the, and the characters are all pretty well defined. I mean, they're, they're very, they're very well described, I think. Um, and, um, it's, they're very distinct. They, they don't, they don't feel like cardboard to me. So there's, but anyway, so if you're looking for a new cozy mystery series with some magic and lots of baked goods, oh, there are recipes. Um, and there are recipes, yes. Peanut butter, swirl brownies, and cheddar sage scones. And I think, I think I have all the ingredients to make those brownies. Just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. Mm. We'll see. I have read more of My Name is Aram. Uh, I have not finished it yet. It's almost a week overdue now. <sighs> I was really, really hoping to get this one finished today. I, I It's not that I'm not liking it. It's They're not my go-to for, for, for storytelling style. But, um, like I said, they're, they're a little reminiscent of Twain and Steinbeck and... And they're different, so I, I I am enjoying it, and I just this has just been a month, and also same for made made for love by Alyssa Nutting, and I was really wanting to read this because there is like a mini challenge for Alphabet Soup, I think, to read a book with a love or love related word in the title and you know affection or adoration something like that um and this was the only thing I had really and I had hoped to get through this but I just just was not in the cards this month and speaking of cards I didn't do a blasted thing with Tara this month so that was kind of a fail. And what else have I failed at? I did actually have some some moderate success on the Historathon challenge. So that's a thing. I did start reading via YouTube video a book called Why is for Y'all on the It's a Southern Thing channel and um and I yeah I'm, they didn't read the whole thing they just read uh Matt just read several pages here and there from it during this other video and, and I'm like yeah I so I broke down and I ordered it so when I get that I will finish reading it um, but it's why is for y'all, and I mean, Missouri is is one of those disputed states. Is it southern or is it not southern? And people will fight over that. They'll fight over whether it's midwestern. Missouri is just one of those weird transitional places. I guess I don't know. It's you know, St. Louis is the gateway to the West. I grew up right near the start of the Santa Fe Trail. The Lewis and Clark Trail is a big deal. And it's definitely Midwestern. It's definitely Southern. Just not all of it. Rural, 
and it, it and it's not even really a geographical split like south of the Missouri is southern and north of the Missouri is midwestern it's not even that and i mean oh and then you've got Kansas City which is a cow town and St. Louis it's, St. Louis is just its own thing it's but you know i'm from rural Missouri and but not exactly i mean I grew up in central Missouri, slash west central Missouri, and but my family, a lot of my family lived in northwestern Missouri, and they're different. But the rural parts of Missouri, no matter where they are in the state, they out south the south. And at the same time, it's a very midwestern mindset. It's... It's just this really strange mix of of things and and cultures and and then the oh yeah the Ozarks well the Ozarks are definitely southern the Boot Heel is southern I mean they they have they grow cotton and yeah and in addition to the book I also got a T-shirt with a little embroidered possum. I actually rescued a baby possum once. Well, my mom and I rescued a baby possum. They're cute. Not as cute as baby skunks. Baby skunks are just freaking adorable. And on that note, please like and subscribe and see you around.